Douglas. Uh, good morning and welcome, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary, Ambassador, uh, distinguished guests, and our in-person audience. Also, good evening to our esteemed speakers who are dialing in from South Asia in the nighttime hours. Thanks everyone for joining our event today on the smaller South Asian countries and the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy in 2024. So what are the smaller South Asian countries? We're focusing on Bangladesh, Bhutan, Maldives, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. And why are we focusing on these countries? India and Pakistan have traditionally dominated policy and scholarly attention towards South Asia and for understandable reasons. But this has left the region's countries that are smaller comparatively underexamined. And this is especially at a time when the rise of China and its increased economic, diplomatic, and military activities with these countries have raised questions about the strategic orientations of Bangladesh, Bhutan, Maldives, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. Then independent of strategic conversations, these countries have much dynamism and deserve more attention on their own terms for a few reasons. They have relatively large populations and growing economies. All, for example, have achieved at least lower middle income economy status, according to the World Bank. They also have key geographic locations and most are conducting national elections within the year. In May, the East-West Center in Washington published a special Asia-Pacific Bulletin series for which I served as guest editor, and it tries to understand the views from these countries about the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy at one year of being into effect. So today, we want to build on this series with our esteemed authors and experts dialing in from South Asia and through keynote remarks from the U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary. We'll discuss these five countries and their relations with the United States as year three begins of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. To deliver the keynote, I'd like to welcome Afreen Akhtar, U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary in the State Department's Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs for Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Maldives, as well as the Office of Security and Transnational Affairs. for having me here today. Uh, and I'd like to recognize Ambassador Gafur, Maldivian Ambassador to the United States, a wonderful partner um, in the us Maldives relationship. Uh, as Melanthi mentioned two years ago, the administration released its Indo-Pacific strategy, and our goal in doing so was to build an Indo-Pacific region based on five key principles, that this region was one, free and open, two, connected, three, prosperous, four, secure, and five, resilient. And so the focus of today's discussion is how we're advancing these principles in the smaller South Asian countries, which are very near and dear to my heart as the Deputy Assistant Secretary covering them. Um, so I thought I'd take a few minutes today to talk through exactly how we're advancing the Indo-Pacific strategy in each of these countries on their own terms, as Malanthi has said. Uh, so first, to advance a free and open region, the United States has launched the South Asia Governance Fund, and this is a fund specifically dedicated to supporting civil society organizations in Bangladesh, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and the Maldives, all the countries that are in the topic of today's discussion. And the goal there, of course, is to support the development of democratic institutions in each of these contexts, like free media and rule of law. So how are we doing that? Well, for instance, in, Nepal, in Bangladesh, Specifically, we're working with farmers to, farmers have been struggling to obtain government services. So the South Asia Governance Fund supported a local organization that helped farmers establish alliances that in turn strengthened their voices, helped ensure accountability, and enabled them to advocate directly with the government to, to receive insurance and make sure their policies better reflected their needs. Uh, the second principle that we're focused on in the Indo-Pacific strategy is building connections across the region. So what does that mean? Well, one key element of that is uh, expanding our diplomatic presence in the region, and there's no better example of how we're doing that than within the Maldives. Um, we were thrilled to recently have the Maldivian embassy reopen its embassy here in the United States, um, and we have established a brand new embassy in the Maldives led by our first ever 
and very energetic <laughs> U.S. Ambassador Hugo Young. And we have a really ambitious agenda for our new partnership, for our partnership in the Maldives, combating climate change, supporting a clean energy transition, supporting Maldives as it seeks to secure and control its waters. And all of this is, again, exemplified by the fact that we have a brand new mission and ambassador there. And as we look to build connections across the region, we're also looking at enhancing our presence and focus in regional and multilateral platforms to access, to, to address these key priorities like climate change, economic growth, and maritime security. So over the past year, the United States has been increasing its focus and, and attention on the Indian Ocean Rim Association. Um, and that started with a high level vi uh, visit. The Deputy Secretary <coughs> visited the Secretariat of Iora in May, and we're also providing technical expertise um, and anticipating greater collaboration with this organization in the years to come. Uh, the third principle is um, enhancing prosperity. So the United States is a Pacific power and we are driving prosperity at home and abroad through our new economic investments in the region, assistance, and trade. So in Sri Lanka, for instance, we just announced a brand new half billion dollar investment in the Port of Colombo to expand its shipping capacity. So the Port of Colombo, if you're unfamiliar, is the largest and busiest transshipment port in the Indian Ocean. It's been operating at 90% for a couple of years now, and this half billion dollar investment will uh, basically increase its capacity and, and enable it to, to cater to more economies in the region. So again, this is a, a new investment that really demonstrates our commitment to the region. In Bangladesh, one of the largest foreign direct investor, as well as like Bangladesh's large, largest single country export de destination. And last year, we took practical steps to improve economic ties by opening a commercial section of the U.S. Embassy to promote trade and investment and to continue to grow this really important economic relationship. To bolster regional security, we increased security and ties with all of these South Asian countries. And we've done that by providing new technology, platforms, and training. So since the launch of the Indo-Pacific Strategy under this administration, U.S. military and law enforcement agencies have trained hundreds of Bangladeshi law enforcement and security personnel and have carried out dozens of joint exercises. So last June, for instance, the Bangladesh Navy sailed the BNS Samadra Joy, a ship acquired by the United States, to Burma to provide humanitarian aid to victims of Cyclone Mocha. And we also um, sent uh, Sri Lanka a U.S. Coast Guard cutter, and we were really uh, excited to see Sri Lanka step up as a regional maritime security leader uh, and join uh, Operation Prosperity Guardian in the Red Sea using one of our, the ships that we provided them. Finally, regional security, regional resilience uh, tra to transnational threats. How are we supporting regional resilience in these, in these smaller South Asian contexts? One way we're doing it um, is through the Quad, which is, of course, US, India, Japan, and Australia. Um, through the Quad, we, we donated 400 million COVID-19 vaccines across the Indo-Pacific region, including in some of these contexts, and, have been, and separately have put climate change and clean energy at the core of our partnerships in the region. So how have we done that in these countries? We've launched the Climate Action Champions Network, which includes participants from Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh to engage the next generation of climate leaders and help them pursue climate advocacy and projects that respond to the local needs of those communities. Um, Bhutan, we haven't talked about a lot, but I'll mention it here. Uh, Bhutan is an energy-rich country. It's a really important regional player in terms of cross-border electricity trade. There's a, a tremendous ability to export Bhutan's hydropower to India and across the region. Um, and under the USAID South Asia Regional Energy Partnership, the United States has helped Bhutan export its surplus energy to India. So that is really just a snapshot of the thousands of ways we are working with the South Asian partners that I referenced here today. Um, we know that the benefits of this collaboration pay real dividends here at home, and as we collaborate on things like public health crises uh, and economic growth, we, are no we know that we're better protecting ourselves and driving our own prosperity and opportunity here in the United States. And so I look forward to this discussion, and we in the United States really look forward to continuing to build these relationships in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa.
assistance, sec assistance secretary, that was a very clear snapshot of well, what's going on. We really appreciate that. Um, and it really helps bring context and clarity to what we're talking about today. And so I want to turn it over to our other speakers uh, that we have with us, joining us from South Asia. And I want to introduce them all to you as well. First, we have uh, Formal Palma. He's the diplomatic correspondent for the Daily Star in Bangladesh. He reports and analyzes local news and international life international relations in Bangladesh, and his work has also been featured in Asia International News. We also have Abhasna Pandey, lecturer at the Department of International Relations and Diplomacy in Trinidad University. She's a program manager at the Center for Investigative Journalism in Nepal as well. Previously, she worked as the editorial page editor at the Kamadu Post. We have uh, Dr. Ranga Jayasurya, a fellow at the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Hawaii. He's also a journalist and columnist at the Daily Mirror in Sri Lanka. We have Dr. Pasang Dorji, freelance journalist and a former member of the parliament of Bhutan. He was previously working as the chief reporter with Bhutan Times and an editorial at The Journalist. He was the first president of the Journalist Association of Bhutan and was a founding member and a board director of the Bhutan Transparency Initiative. We also have Dr. Rashida D, Senior Fellow at the South Asia Foresight Network. She previously worked for the United Nations in their peacekeeping in Liberia and at the Commonwealth Joint Office for the Permanent Missions in the UN in New York City. So we have a great lineup for you, and we want to start with Formal uh, Pamela with his remarks. Hello, uh, good evening and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so let me start uh, with a little bit of history of uh, Bangladesh. Uh, in 1971, it was the Cold War period when Bangladesh was created. Uh, the United States and China, the major you know, rivals in today's world, were actually against the creation of Bangladesh. Uh, on the other hand, India uh, and Russia uh, very actively supported the uh, independence of Bangladesh. Uh, and after the independence, uh, you know, uh, when you know, the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, uh, he found that uh, uh, the global powers, I mean, the uh, Western countries, uh, as well as uh, the uh, Islamic Arab countries and the Asian countries, including China, uh, all were important. And he formulated a foreign policy, which is uh, very popularly known as, you know, friendship to all and malice to none. So, which means that uh, we'll have to maintain relationship with all the countries of the world. Uh, very tragically, uh, after, I mean, in 75, 1975, <clears throat> he was killed and uh, there was a sort of 15 years of uh, military coup and counter coup, all these, I mean, there were, military regimes that dominated in uh, for 15 years. And the democracy was restored in 1990. Uh, and since then it continues, though there are ups and downs and uh, many debates, uh, you might have known about this. Uh, but all through, uh, Bangladesh's real development started uh, in, in 1990. Uh, and you know that uh, Bangladesh is a uh, country where e there is a lot of, you know, natural disaster and it's a victim of uh, climate change. So, and it's a small country, but a huge population, uh, 170 million uh, people uh, are here in this country. Uh, and, I mean, based on the foreign policy uh, and its desire to see the country as a stable, uh, a peaceful country, as well as uh, uh, it, it wants to see the region a stable and uh, prosperous region. So it always, you know, uh, tried to have cooperation among the uh, regional countries, as well as it played a very uh, active role in the UN system. And... Uh, it had uh, maritime disputes with India and uh, Myanmar, but uh, it very amicably uh, was, you know, resolved uh, through UNCLOS. 
Uh, now, of course, Bangladesh is uh, has significantly developed over the last one and a half uh, decades, and uh, it's a very rising power uh, in, in, in this region, in Asia, you can say. Uh, but when uh, that was the case, uh, the global situation has rapidly changed, and uh, uh, the rebel, the competition among the global powers has uh, be, has has, has uh, risen, and uh, especially the polarization uh, has you know intensified since the Russia Ukraine war, and the countries like Bangladesh uh, are facing intense uh, pressure. Uh, and when Indo Pacific has become uh, a center of you know competition of the global powers. And especially uh, the U.S. Uh, launched its uh, in the Pacific strategy, uh, as well as uh, uh, the China uh, started its uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, it's a dilemma. There, there is a pressure, and which is uh, public uh, quite often through media and through the ambassadors and other diplomats of these uh, major powers. And uh, last year. Uh, you might have noticed that uh, a lot of attention was there on Bangladesh ahead of the uh, national polls. Uh, the Russian diplomats, uh, diplomats from US, uh, China, they were very frequently speaking. So uh, against this uh, backdrop, uh, Bangladesh also last year launched uh, Indo-Pacific Outlook uh, because there were a lot of questions uh, how Bangladesh is uh, whether Bangladesh is joining uh, in the Pacific strategy, or I mean, as it it was also it also signed the Belt and Road Initiative of China. So there were you know very frequent questions from uh, media and other uh, uh, stakeholders, and uh, based on uh, at that background against that background, uh, Bangladesh launched the uh, in the Pacific Outlook. Uh, this in the Pacific outlook and uh, in the Pacific strategy of the United States uh, appear quite similar. Uh, something uh, a little bit different that is there in in the Pacific outlook is that it it uttered the word inclusive. So it also uh, it means that uh, it doesn't want to exclude anyone. It wants an inclusive uh, in the Pacific strategy alongside the other you know, uh, uh, features, which include uh, open, free, uh, secure, peaceful uh, in the Pacific. And <clears throat> uh, over the last uh, uh, four or five years, uh, there was a lot of discussion on whether Bangladesh uh, signs two uh, you know, defense treaties. One is uh, Jisumia and the other is uh, AXA. And uh, Bangladesh appeared to be uh, quite reluctant uh, about signing because uh, Bangladesh thinks that um, signing this treaty um, may appear to be a Bangladesh taking a side or joining a military alliance. Uh, this sort of thinking uh, was also triggered by the fact that uh, the United States uh, enacted uh, uh, law, Burma Act, and uh, there is much uh, discussion about this, that uh, United States may want Bangladesh to provide, you know, uh, access so, you know, the arms can be transported to uh, Myanmar. And already Bangladesh is facing a lot of troubles because of the Rohingya crisis. Uh, there was a lot of potential potentials for Bangladesh to, you know, uh, have access uh, through, I mean, towards Southeast Asian countries uh, through Myanmar, but that has not been possible because of uh, this Rohingya crisis for uh, the last uh, four or five decades. Against this background, um, what Bangladesh wants is that we want to live with all, uh, there shouldn't be any uh, conflict over the in the Pacific or the over the Bay of Bengal. Uh, and with this uh, position, uh, my strong belief, uh, and also uh, the experts that I talk to uh, say that uh, because India is a big neighbor and uh, India has 
quite significant influence uh, over the politics of Bangladesh. Um, so in regional uh, uh, issues, uh, Bangladesh also uh, shares a lot of uh, ideas with uh, India. And India also does not want any other powers to be in this area. Uh, so uh, Bangladesh uh, is very reluctant about allowing any superpowers to you know, have uh, control uh, here and which can lead to any uh, military you know, confrontation. So uh, whether or not Bangladesh is able to maintain this uh, balance will uh, largely depend on how Bangladesh can uh, address its challenges uh, in, in, in its internal politics as well as its economy. So if Bangladesh is, is economically uh, you know, better, it can improve its governance, uh, it can uh, check its corruption, and sort of you know money laundering uh, these things. Uh, eventually, Bangladesh will be able to make the balance. Otherwise, it may be uh, difficult. Great, thank you so thank much. You. Appreciate that. I'd like to go right next to uh, Bansa Bandi <laughs> for her remarks. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, East West Center, for organizing this and like asking me to first of all write this piece and then now asking me to be one of the speakers has been a real privilege. Um, to start off with, with my remarks, um, I think the most interesting thing, I don't want to go into the history of the country, uh, but for me, I want to go straight into the whole MCC episode. For Nepal, the MCC episode was, was, was quite interesting in the way it was handled in the sense that it had been in the picture for, for a long time, but there was a lot of stir when it had to be ratified, right? So when, when there was this whole, um, it had become such a public issue, there was a lot of chatter about it. And the most interesting thing about the whole MCC episode in Nepal was that it wasn't the people who were in the security circle, who were in the policy circle, who were talking about it. And for me, the way I perceived it, I think it's one of those first instances or one of those, you know, huge instances of spreading misinformation in, in Nepal because everybody in Nepal was talking about MCC. It did not matter whether you were an IR expert or whether you were any scholar or whether you know anything about politics or foreign policy. None of that mattered. If you look at the way it was treated over here, there were truck, a lot of truck and then like, you know, um, you know, random walls on the highway where they had messages of no MCC, go back America, you know, so the fact that it had gone down to such grassroots level to such local people who did not even know what they were talking about, suddenly everybody was talking about security. And that was a very interesting thing for me. And I think that was the biggest challenge also in, for the US when it came to, you know, ratifying the whole MCC process was that, you know, something something like MCC or whatever we do in foreign policy, it's of course a small circle of people who are talking about it. It's, it's usually the elite or people who are involved in that sector who are, you know, doing the talking or who are trying to shape the policies and everything. But here in Nepal, suddenly with MCC, the kind of information or misinformation, disinformation campaign, call it whatever you may, that had gone, that had been launched, everybody was talking about MCC. Everybody was skeptical about, oh my God, America's going to come and, you know, we're not going to be a sovereign country anymore. So that kind of paranoia among, you know, each section of the population, each, you know, age group, small people from small kids to, you know, old people, everybody was just talking about, oh my God, what is like, MCC was, was such a big, um, big, big threat. And that was a very interesting episode. And I think that is also a very big lesson for, for the American establishment as well, the way they had been doing their public diplomacy. I think, you know, a lot of that changed after this whole MCC episode. In the end, I mean, uh, you know, it, it was ratified. But before the, the ratification process, uh, the, the, before the ratification happened, the kind of stir it created was very unusual in the Nepal, the way, you know, Nepal has been conducting foreign policy. So I think MCC first or, you know, its large extension of Indo-Pacific strategy has to be seen in that light. Of course, like we had already signed the BRI and then we were going to be a part of IPS. But but the whole polarization, like Parimol was, Parimol was also pointing out that, you know, you're either this or that. 
it's either yes or no, you know, that kind of thing is not going to work anymore because I think one of the um, beauties of, of, you know, democratic societies is that we have this unusual capacity to adapt and to cooperate with, with anyone that we can. And I think IPS, the way um, in the end, the way in the way Nepal handled IPS has been an example of that. The fact that, you know, we don't necessarily have to be taking sides on everything that's over there. Of course, there will be fundamental things that uh, fundamental values that a country will, will attach itself to. But when it comes to economic prosperity, when it comes to building partnerships, when it comes to building co coalitions, the foremost thing that is important for any country, not just for Nepal, for, for any other country is, is the national interest. So even for Nepal, be the whether we you know sign the BRI, whether we sign the MC, uh, IPC, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, it's all keeping our national interest first. And one of the other things that this whole episode created was in Nepal. If you talk to the people over here, it has sort of um, shifted the mindset of the people. So initially, before this whole episode, uh, we used to because you know we've been saying that you know uh, that we're talking to other smaller countries in South Asia. And I believe whatever you believe, that's what you become, right? So the initial mindset before this whole thing was Nepal is a small country. We have no influence. We're a yam between two boulders. We have two big neighbors. We have China. We have India and Nepal is sandwiched between the two. That was the mindset that we had, that we were a yam between two boulders. But I think with MCC, with this whole BRI, and then now the Indo-Pacific strategy, and the, there's a lot of happen, a lot of things happening geopolitically, and with this eventful, uh, you know, episodes, the change that has happened in Nepal is, you know, there's a shift of mindset from Nepal being a yam between two boulders to Nepalis thinking, or you know, policymakers are thinking, okay, we're at a geostrategically important place, you know, geopolitically we're at a strategic place. So there's a shift in that mindset that has happened, and that's I think something that um we need to be wary of. So these are the two things um, that have happened with this whole, um, you know, in, in the past three, two, three years. And um, so these are things I think that, um, you know, we should pick and then and, and think about. Of course, uh, Nepal, there has been problems with, with the I, uh, MCC implementation, right? It was such a fanfare when we did it, but now already, we 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 signed it for a five year period, and now already there are. It looks like MCC is hitting a roadblock because there has been, uh, you know, the construction of transmission line has been rejected because you know the the bid prices that were substantially higher than the original bid prices. So there are these problems that are there. But despite these problems, I think the case for Nepal would be to, uh, to to you know, to um, to sort of put its interest first and to not look at things from, okay, you know, what am I going to lose if I side here or what am I not going to lose if I don't, you know, take this side? I think it's it's not about taking sides anymore. It's it's more about uh, pursuing your national interest, pursuing your economic security. Again, there was this a lot of talk about how Indo-Pacific strategy and a lot of the uh, initiatives that have been launched over years are, are actually welcome, right? So, you know, Nepal was, there's a lot of exchanges that has been happening, like it was mentioned in the keynote speeches that, uh, you know, increasing the level of diplomatic uh, exchanges is one of the key pillars of Indo-Pacific strategy, right? And we've been seeing that in Nepal, there's a lot of high-level visits from in, from from U.S. Uh, the um, Nepal's foreign minister visited the U.S. in November, where he met the Secretary of State, State Anthony Blinken. And, you know, a lot of these things were not reciprocated before, but I think now what has the change that we're seeing is these things are being reciprocated. And because of this reciprocity, Nepal also feels like, okay, it feels ownership of the things that, that it's doing. And it just does not in a way feel imposed or like, you know, it does not feel the burden of anything anymore because it feels like, okay, we're in, in, in a place where we can reciprocate things. We're in a place where we can also, you know, uh, like like it was mentioned in, in, the, in the keynote speech that, you know, the US is trying to engage with the partner on their own terms. So I think a lot of those things have been coming uh, have have been have have started to become a reality for us. Uh, like Nepal was in, in included in the dem is included in the democracy delivers initiative of the U.S. and I think in, in a lot of the summits that have been happened, uh, Nepal is is included again. This whole um this whole you know aid that that MCC it's the single largest country donation to Nepal ever. 
So of course it is of, of a huge significance for us. It's not something that we could have turned down in any way, despite all the chatter, despite all the protests, despite all the backlash. You know, this whole idea of connectivity, you know, transmission lines, all of that is important for Nepal because energy trade, you know, the whole security sector is 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 a big, big part for Nepal. And we're talking, if we're talking about uh, prosperity, if we're talking about resilience, everything has to be in place. And transmission line infrastructures, being able, able to, you know, counter transnational security threats, all of those things are important. So I think, um, you know, with this, uh, with this um, whole uh, new outlook that the U.S. has towards Nepal, and Nepal also has has of itself, not about U.S., but the fact that Nepal also has has a renewed identity about itself. I think this is going to prove a, a, a an enduring partnership for both the countries because, like I said, uh, you know we're 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 all open societies and. The fact that we can adapt to each other makes us more dynamic. And because of the shared value of pluralism and, and diversity that we have, and the fact that, you know, we're also looking at Nepal from a renewed lens of, of a lens of, you know, we're a country of importance. I think that's where the the new point in, in the partnership lies. And, and I think that's, that's the point that we should be taking, um, you know, we should be paying really close attention to. And I think that should, that would be a good starting point for all of us. Great, thank you so much. I'd like to quickly turn now to Dr. Raga Jayasurya for his remarks. Okay, then I'll I'll proceed. So basically, I I'll, I'll start. I'll talk about Sri Lanka, the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy in Sri Lanka. So actually, now now what we are going through is a rather better time of the U.S. relations with the Sri, with Sri Lanka. By, because it had a lean period during uh, 2010 to 2014, then again after 2019 to until the defeat of the uh, Gotabaya Rajapaksa administration. But to start with, I'll, I'll explain how this turned out. Uh, Sri Lanka is basically what we consider, like my previous colleague said, uh, Nepal suddenly found out that rather than it being trapped between two uh, giants, it's a uh, it, it is actually strategically important. Where Sri Lankans have always been saying we are being located in a place which is very strategically important. So there is a fact that we the, the, the maritime uh, sea lines of communications connecting with east and west is running, I, I mean, going running to Sri Lanka. But at the same time, Sri Lanka has a, while claiming strategically important, it has not been able to capitalize on that. So it's so much talk, but not uh, substance until very much very recently. So Sri Lanka has been, I mean, Sri Lanka, like the rest of the South Asian countries, small countries, have been rather insulated from the, what you call, great power rivalry, either between the uh, United States and Soviet Union, or uh, now, until very recently. but. That's partly, but that's mainly because of India's overbearing inter interest in Sri Lanka and in, in its South Asian neighbors, which it considers as uh, its sphere of influence. But the fact is, while India has a large uh, gamble, wa uh, large uh, bundle of interest, it did not have actual uh, real powers to maintain such uh, interest. So what happened was, at one point of time, China, as while it was growing, it spilled into the into the South Asian region. So during the from 2006 to 2019, Sri Lanka obtained about 12.9 in China in infrastructure loans from China, and China very easily replaced Japan as the primary development partner. So Chinese, I mean Chinese. Uh, investment portfolio is very, very expensive from the sea uh, port, which, which is now being uh, leased out to China for 99 years, and also a large uh, port city that has been constructed in Colombo seafront, and also many, many other large investments. So China is pretty much the sort of the pillar of Sri Lanka when it comes to the Foreign, foreign relations of Sri Lanka for until very recently. 
until we defaulted those loans. So, so this is how it turned out in the Sri Lankans. Uh, at the at the time of default, China has about about fifty five percent of Sri Lanka's bilateral debt. So, as for the U.S. Indo Pacific strategy, what uh, it since it was initiated in two thousand eleven, so the the with regard to Sri Lanka, its, it's emphasis was on the this war crime. The, the Sri Lanka, if you know, uh, Sri Lanka went through a, a tough period, and we had a civil war which ended in two thousand nine. With the complete annihilation of the LTT, which was which is also a terrorist group uh, designated in the US and about 20 other old countries as well. So do you, the, but the US emphasis during that time was it's rather obsessive on, on the war crimes and also the UN human rights the and US support sponsored the UN Human Rights Commission uh, uh, Council resolution. So these things basically obscured the, the larger US strategy, making Sri Lankans think this is rather external threat that we should rally around. Or rather, the government at the time, which was Paul Eri Rajapaksa, made it look like look like uh, external threat. And Mr. Rajapaksa went around the country, just beating, saying he will go to the electric chair if it has to, if the Sri Lanka has to go for international crime criminal court. So these are these external threats can be easily this. Pursued U.S. sort of uh, action can be pursued at home as something negative and can be used to mobilize people. It worked for the Rajapaksa government pretty well. So, and also there was no substantial uh, economic dimension in the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy from the very beginning until very recently. So, with, if you compare the China's role, it, 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 it doesn't hold water because it's you need the substantial economic help to balance China if you want to balance, play, I mean, be, make a counter, uh, counter its power in the South Asian region. Because the, Asia, the countries in the region is more focused on economic development. They are themselves catching up on their economic development. So they are rather less inclined towards these great power rivals other than India, I think. So if you look at Sri Lankan domestic system, so no matter how much effort United States or any, any other country makes, its its domestic system is highly polarized. There is one government, the one party, which is very, which is somewhat leaning to the to the United States and the West, whereas the government of the previous government of the Rajapaksas and which which, which had a massive majority until they 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 were sort of thrown out in massive protest, public protest. Uh, they were more inclined, more lean towards China. So that dynamic played out throughout the relationship between relations throughout the last 20, decade, 20 years, I guess, between Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka relations with the United States. So one of the most uh, notable incidents was in, in, uh, during the 2014 and uh, the government of 2014 to 19, that is a government led by current uh, Prime Minister, current President uh, uh, Ryan Vikram Singh. They negotiated the Millennium Grant, uh, the Talent Corporation Grant of about half a billion dollars. It's 480 million US dollars, which is a grant. But the next government rather gave it a cold shoulder, claiming that will have serious, significant implication on na national security. Some guys went telling, we have to go to, uh, we have to take a visa to go to uh, some parts of the area which will come under uh, this uh, agreement. So basically, the later the US itself gave it up because government is not responding. responding. So, so now in 2020-21, we had a major economic uh, transmission or transition or major collapse. So economic crisis and the collapse of Mahindra Rajapaksa and the Gotabe Rajapaksa government brought in a government a president which is very pro Lili. So I think uh, at the moment they are very much inclined towards uh, towards uh, the West and the uh, interestingly because most other presidents have made official visit by that time by this time to China but this guy hasn't uh, apparently either he's not uh, uh, sort of uh, Release received uh, in better form, so either he's not inclined to go there. 
Yes, I, I heard my, my president of Maldives just went uh, soon after he was uh, sworn in. So, so there, this government, the current government is pretty much pro leaning, pro, pro Western leaning. So, and also Chinese infrastructure loans are can, at the moment they are under scrutiny because one problem is that there is some people erroneously say this is because Sri Lanka has defaulted. This is not the case. Sri Lanka has defaulted because we have borrowed so much uh, commercial loans in, in the international sovereign bonds at uh, thumping uh, interest rates. And uh, that is that is the fundamental, uh, which is about one third of the Sri Lanka all external borrowings. That is the reason for the uh, it's default. But Chinese loans were not, uh, not appropriately, not optimally utilized. So there are concerns more uh, over these things, the, these, the, these elements as well. So, US Indo Pacific strategy in Sri Lanka and also, I guess, it's why, why the South Asia is, is implemented through its regional partners. Because these regional partners are, have more weight, more, more, what do you call, uh, so are received better by the regional alley, regional con smaller countries, as well as the, their domestic systems. Because Sri Lankans consider Japan as a very peace-loving, uh, amenable uh, country, whereas it's not so much, so much sort of, uh, not even that sort of uh, sentiments are not even directed to India, let even uh, United States. So in Sri, in, in Sri Lankan context, China, in India and Japan are very important. So actually, the, uh, I heard the previously it was stated that the U.S. gave about uh, 553 million U.S. dollars finance assistance. That is not to the government of Sri Lanka, but to the Adani ports, which is run by the Adani, uh, which recently came under certain uh, uh, trading uh, scandal as well. But they are they have a very strong, very expansive uh, economic role at the moment in in the uh, renewable energy, solar powers, and the ports. And I, I heard they are also bidding for the Sri Lanka Telecom, and so they they have expansive role and uh, and also US uh, committed about two hundred and forty million during dollars during the Sri Lankan fi finance financial crisis, so, and also government at the moment is uh, negotiating with the US to renew, see whether we can revive the uh, Millennium Challenge, uh, Challenge Cooperation Agreement as well as. Uh, also, other 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 major regional states such as Japan. Japan uh, funded uh, JICA funded project for for uh, Colombo Metro Railway, which was also suspended by the Gota Beraja Press Agreement Administration. So, we are looking into whether we can renew. Of course, the the Metro Railway will be relaunched, but the rest we are looking forward whether we are negotiating whether we can pull this off, and also. Uh, as previously stated, the president said he want to uh, negotiate. Is sort of considering that whether we can send a ship ship to the Red Sea. I don't think Sri Lanka can make much much dent on the <laughs> Houthis or anyone else. But it is a sad, rather symbolic gesture, and also that uh, I'm sure the government, which is also more America loving, so they they think that will be reciprocated well. So, but the question is whether Sri Lanka actually has. Uh, Sufficient uh, 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 air defense systems. These are all U.S. ships. In fact, United States gifted about three ships, three Coast Guard cutters to Sri Lanka. The third, la last one was in 2021. So I think they are sending one of these. But it depends on how the domestic system, people, local people view it. Even at some point, even there is a substantial Muslim mi minority in Sri Lanka, and they are they are I mean they may not be happy. They were not even happy with Sri Lanka sending wo workers to Israel to fill in the gaps of the Palestinian workers who have been uh, I mean kicked out. So there is that element also. But this this may be a publicity publicity stunt. I am not sure, but it's I doubt mm. whether this will be. Taken over. so that and so the what's the future? Uh, this is uh, okay. Well, I finish it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Go to our uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Hassan Torji, for your remarks. Thank you. 
Uh, uh, hi to all. The, here it's night and out there it's morning, so it, we are at a different time zone. Yeah, I do not have uh, exciting stories that my previous friends uh, had to say, uh, because we know that uh, <clears throat> Bhutan does not have diplomatic relations with P5 members of the UN Security Council and uh, the level of engagement that Bhutan has with the US is not as much as rest of the other smaller states in the region have. <clears throat> uh, I would like to make some remarks uh, based on the framework of, of uh, locating Bhutan on the Indo-Pacific geopolitical uh, map. It would be very naive on my part to say that uh, IPS is not relevant to Bhutan, but I think it be, it is all it would also be an exaggeration to say that IPS is very relevant to us, because uh, you all know that Bhutan the, Bhutan is quite far away from where the epicenter of Indo-Pacific geopolitics is taking place, but I must say that uh, IPS has implications for how Bhutan positions itself towards its neighbors, towards bigger powers, its friends around the world. For example, the, if we, from geopolitical sense, if we try to dissect IPS, though we say that it is to ensure open, prosperous, and free Indo-Pacific. At the same time, it also has geopolitical undertones and also overtones, given the rising China on the other hand. And uh, India as a strategic partner of the US. So when we try to look at these relations, Bhutan, we have to take this Indo-Pacific uh, theater and the, its dynamics seriously. Because what happens there has will have uh, ripples on Bhutan and other Himalayan states like Nepal. So, uh, at the moment, uh, how we how Bhutan, from my understanding, how Bhutan looks at Indo-Pacific strategy is that it is to ensure that uh, there is a convergence of interest of big powers. So it is not in the interest of Bhutan to pitch bigger powers that are directly engaged in the Indo-Pacific region against each other. Because uh, we know that uh, small states, uh, most of the times tend to get in the crossfire of the bigger powers. So that uh, maintaining of absolute neutrality in the interest of our national uh, nas national security, sovereignty is very much part of the Bhutan's posturing towards this uh, strategy. So this does not mean that uh, Bhutan is not willing to play part in the global affairs, but at the same time, we should also know that small states have uh, a narrower margin of error so I think that uh, that is very much uh, in the calculations of uh, Bhutan's uh, posturing towards uh, the global community. When I say this, I'm not trying to say that uh, Bhutan like to take sides. There, there are some narrative, especially coming from uh, uh, the Western academic uh, scholarship and especially media that if you are not with the US, you must be with China. I think that is not necessarily true with most of the smaller states in South Asia, because we know the state that we have. And I think small states are very sensitive about their sovereignty, independence, and autonomy. And it is not in the interest of these smaller states to pitch the bigger powers against each other. And I think Bhutan, Bhutan has made it very clear. So as, as I said, uh, one thing that maybe the, maybe the scholars or people who are in the strategic community in the powerful countries 
might be uh, interested to hear what uh, could be the perspectives of people in the smaller states. My, my, my understanding is that now the, the global political dynamics is changing. And uh, previously, most of the small states were branded as client states, uh, dependent, uh, economically dependent. Now, I think this narrative is also changing because now small states, because of the competition, the con uh, confrontational nature of the rising powers, I think small states are also becoming net security providers. So I think that perspective is uh, could be interesting or useful to look at this Indo-Pacific strategy as well. So maybe I will leave my comment at this and if you all have questions, uh, I'll be willing to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dorsey. And then uh, now Dr. Rashida D for her remarks. Dr. D. Thank you so much for inviting um, I, uh, to this seminar for those of us who are far away and cannot be present. Um, excuse my voice because I've had a sore throat and uh, bad cough, so I may not be clear uh, sometimes, but please do bear with me. Um, my few comments will be on the US strategy and or Indo-Pacific strategy and the, and the Maldives perspective, how the Maldives looks at it. Uh, first of all, I like to mention that the Maldives became um, geopolitically important after China, the Maldives strengthened its relationship with China between 2013 and 2018 which was during a previous um, government. And um, <clears throat> the relationship strengthened so much that most of the infrastructure projects were given to them uh, and also signed um, a free trade agreement, which had not been ratified since then. So it's still not in operation yet. Um, and also multiple memoranda of understandings were signed. In addition, as I told you, there was the, the infrastructure projects given to them. And the most special was the China Maldives Friendship Bridge. It's called the sign of, <clears throat> excuse me, between the capital island and the airport island and the next neighboring island which was seen as a very important, in fact, it is important in, when we think of uh, communication between the airport and the capital, where uh, especially when people are sick can be taken on the road, by road, instead of by sea. So that's a great asset. <coughs> Excuse me. Then also on top of all this, the Maldives changed the land law, which was unprecedented. Renting land law means renting islands. The, we, we rent inhabited islands, the government rents. Now, before it was the most period, the, the highest period that somebody can rent an island was for 50 years. But with China coming in and wanting islands, the land law was changed to um, 99 years, so which was an unprecedented uh, move by the government. So because of this attention given to China, um, Maldives became a battleground, a geostrategic uh, battleground for China, India, and the US. Uh, then I look at the fluctuating relationship between the US and the Maldives. Now the relationship was um, stable until 2013, as I told you. And between 2013 and 2018, things changed because the government's policy and behavior, foreign policy and behavior changed in that the government annihilated, in fact, um, alienated a lot of the international 
partners, such as the Commonwealth, with whom we had been since independence um, in 1965. Then also alienated um, the EU and some individual countries like India and Qatar. Qatar, who had been a friend of the Maldives, not such a great friend, but still nevertheless a friend. <laughs> Uh, and so this was uh, the bad time in the relationship between the Maldives and the U.S. But gradually, or during that time, actually, the U.S. Um, declared a statement in that it said, issue statement in that it said it would, quote, consider appropriate measures against those individuals who undermine democracy, the rule of law, and a free and fair electoral process. And that was, that was like, a, um, although there was no action as such, it was like a, a, a warning to the Maldives from the US. Um, <clears throat> then, of course, things started to improve since 2018, when a change of government occurred, uh, in which the Maldives Democratic, Par Democratic Party came into existence. And um, then the warming up of relationship towards India started, and other, you know, Commonwealth rejoined the Commonwealth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we became sort of normal, quote unquote, normal. Um, the way we used to be. <clears throat> so during this time, um, the US, um, there was a huge achievement in the signing of um, the framework for US Department of Defense. So it was signed with the Maldives Ministry of Defense and the Security Relations in September, 2022. This was a landmark achievement in the relationship because it set for, forth both countries' intent to deepen engagement and uh, cooperation in maintaining peace and security in the Indian Ocean. Then, <clears throat> of course, there are um, views of critics now they are saying, why should the US become more friendly with the Maldives again. And then those are those other the, the pessimists will say this. Now the US, because it stand its relationship, or oh, it stand in Diego Garcia is somewhat shaky because of Mauritius. Um, <clears throat> so where, where they need to look at another place, another location in the Indian Ocean. And why not the Maldives? Maldives is the best place in the Indian Ocean for that because of its proximity to international sea lanes, um, excuse me, <clears throat> through which two thirds of the world's oil and half of its containment shipments pass through. So that's another view. Uh, then I'm looking. Then of course, in the, <laughs> excuse me, in the improved relationship, the Maldives um, welcomed all the increasing resources that Washington's Indo-Pacific region brings, such as um, the assistance from the United States um, Agency for International Development, whose programs for the last past 20 years had been very useful for the Maldives. Great. Thank you, Dr. Dean. Thank you. We want to ask the audience uh, for their questions. We have a couple more minutes left so we can get some of your thoughts and comments. We know we've got a lot of speakers here for you, giving you a lot of information. All right. Thank you. Um, so if there are any questions for our speakers, we have a microphone. And if you have a specific question for a specific panelist, please uh, address that as well. Yes, sir, right here. Yes. Uh, my name is Gulam Surawardi. I am uh, the publisher of Saudi Asia Journal. My question is for Mr. Polymov from Bangladesh. Uh, you have covered uh, actually some historical perspective, but my question is specific, which is you said the democracy started in 1991, 
which I agree with you. And then, presently, uh, the election that happened, is, uh, we had dummy candidates, our, our meeting, basically it's all one party. So what do you see in the future is, is uh, with this one party system in Bangladesh? Do we have democracy? Please comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yes, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, debate about the election, and uh, now uh, many are saying that uh, it's a one-party uh, state and all this. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, there, I mean, I mean, the opposition parties uh, also had role, and it was uh, regretted by many that uh, the opposition, the major opposition, BNP did not take part in it. And it is uh, kind of depriving the people of their right to vote uh, the very party. Uh, definitely, uh, the ruling party could have done much more and should have done much more. Uh, there could have been dialogue, uh, or I mean, on on the caretaker government system, which is uh, in in I mean Bangladesh, sort of interim arrangement for elections. So though a lot of things could have done, but things did not happen. But uh, I mean, I cannot say the future of uh, Bangladesh's democracy. Uh, and I think it will depend on how the uh, stakeholders, how the people react how the people react, uh, as well as how the international community, you know, works on that. Just the other day, uh, UK High Commissioner, um, during her meeting with the foreign minister, said that uh, they want uh, reconciliation among the political parties. And um, next, I mean, two, three years will be really very uh, important time for Bangladesh, uh, whether we could... I mean, our political parties could uh, reconcile or make some sort of reform uh, whereby uh, the elections are held in a more free uh, and transparent manner. Thank you. Great. Do we have any other questions? We'll take a couple more. Yes, over here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lisa Gola. I'm a Korean psychologist and currently a uh, visiting scholar at USC Chapel Hill. Uh, Ukraine factor became uh, significant in foreign policy of the whole world. And I cannot say Ukraine is a small country, but at least in the context of the US China rivalry, it became significant. And outcome, outcome of this war will affect all uh, regions, including in the Pacific, it's very clear. So I would like to ask, uh, is the narratives about this outcome it, it presence in Indo-Pacific countries as well? So do you understand that this war is about democracy and outcome is very important in your countries as well? Thank you. Um. Yeah, I mean, like, like I said, right, that I think first of all, what the the biggest thing that we have to look at is is the global impact of the uh, Russia Ukraine war, which is that you know it has in a way shifted the debate globally back to the whole point about you know where is the world headed? You know, are we going to be aligning ourselves politically and ideologically like we did during the times of Cold War? So I think that's that's a question on the global scale. So that, that has been one of the biggest impacts of the Ukraine and Russia war for me. And because we have these, if we're having these conversations on a global scale, these conversations will trickle down to, you know, the the, so the, the all the subsets. So, and South Asia, again, is not going to be, you know, bereft of these conversations. In South Asia, and particularly in Nepal, the conversation, like I said, is, is about, you know, for Nepal, like I said, the, the shift in mindset is like, you know, that we're not a country, we're not a yam between two boulders anymore. We're thinking of ourselves as a country that is, you know, ge geopolitically more relevant, geopolitically more strategic. So these are the conversations, yes, that have been happening. And again, I think one of the things that has also put, uh, that has shifted the conversation for Nepal is the whole issue of climate change. Uh, and this is, again, 
not exactly related to uh, the Ukraine and Russia war, but again, it will have indirect consequences about when it comes to food security, when it comes to, um, you know, Nepal sending its its people in in the you know UN peace missions and all of those things will will they're all interconnected. Sometimes the interconnection might not be so visible and not so evident right away, but if you just scratch beneath the surface, there are a lot of these interconnecting things that are happening. So I think with this whole episode of uh, of the Ukraine and Russia war, what is in it for Nepal is that um, we're increasingly being aware of what our national interest is, what we should be doing as a country. Like uh, Dr. Doja said, where are we positioning ourselves in this whole, you know, when it comes to Indo-Pacific strategy or when it comes to Nepal BRI, where are we positioning ourselves? What are the values that we want to align ourselves with? And it's not about, you know, like like again like dr doja said it's not about taking when you're taking one side you're leaving out the other it's about coexisting with whatever you have in in the you know we are in 193 countries and and because we're talking about a multipolar world we're talking about a new you know there are talks about new global order which is this there are going to be three poles which is one is there going to be global east there's the global west and there is the global south again global west is going to be headed by us and Europe, Global East is going to be headed by Russia and China, and Global South, where, you know, countries like us come in, you know, where we don't have a fixed political identity or a fixed um, fixed sort of line we're taking. We're a loose coalition of countries who are just trying to advance their national interest. And, it, you know, sometimes we, we will be siding with, with India for a, for, a, for a certain reason. We will be siding with Sri Lanka for a certain reason. We will be siding with Bangladesh for a certain reason. We will be siding with, with Bhutan for a certain reason. Again, climate is a big part. Nepal and Bhutan can, you know, the way I see it can be, you know, um, at the forefront of, of tackling climate change in South Asian region. So, you know, you have these small small pockets and small areas of friendship and then you know small 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 groupings that you can be a part of so i think the biggest implication of of the whole russia and ukraine war in in this part of the world or specifically in the south asian region is that you know you don't necessarily have to align with with one one country or you know one side you can align with as many countries and as many um you know you can be a part of as many groups as you want as long as you're clear about what your national interest is and what is it you're trying to secure by being a part of that coalition or by deciding not to be a part of that coalition. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming. We had a great uh, discussion today and some of these insights about the US Indo Pacific strategy and how these countries are looking at it. Uh, if you haven't already, I want to encourage you to read uh, their articles, uh, their Asia Pacific bulletins that they wrote for us uh, about this topic. And then I also want to let you know that my colleague Ross Tokla has a report coming out about uh, the perspectives of US allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific about the US Indo-Pacific strategy. So that report's coming out soon, so please kind of check back with us as that report release uh, will come out soon. Uh, I want to thank Nalanti and Zoe for all their hard work, our young professionals for their hard work as well, putting this event together. Uh, please join me in thanking our speakers. Very great job.